Okay. So, so we are live as of right now. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I don't know what you really wanted to talk about, um, but I kind of thought it'd be really interesting to talk about something that's fascinating me at the moment, um, which is the exponential function. Yeah. Uh, you know that, uh, I know it seems a bit contrived, but basically the exponential function is, is I just need to talk to you about it because I had some, like a, a bit of a, an epiphany the other day and it's a bit of a something it, it, it'll take me a while to sort of um uh, to explain it i guess so you'll have to bear with me but i i came across um something the other day which i i i, I kind of got me interested and it was um albert einstein who who talked about the uh, the exponential function and he mm -hmm. said the uh, the exponential function, um, he didn't mention it in so many terms. He called it compound interest, but compound interest actually requires the exponential function to work. So he was talking about compound interest, and, but it got me thinking about the exponential function. He, he said um, that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Um, those who understand it, earn it, and those who don't, pay it. And um, obviously he was talking about money because our current economic system is based on um, interest it has interest as a sort of fundamental uh, component um, mm -hmm. so therefore you get compound interest which is the exponential function but it, it occurred to me in a completely different way and blew my mind um, and it comes down to something that you said actually do you remember you told me the other day that about family trees and there's a lot of lost a lot of lost uh, knowledge. You remember yeah, that? yeah. Uh, in relation to um, you know people living whole their whole lives and all of that information basically disappearing, um, or not all of it, but at least a, a vast percentage of it disappearing because it's not it's not passed on. Yeah, absolutely. It's lost. It's lost uh, in the ether of time or whatever wherever these this knowledge goes. I mean, does knowledge just disappear? What is knowledge? I don't know. You know, but uh, but it but it just vanishes, and and it got me thinking because uh, a while ago, and I'll come back to the exponential function, and, I'll, and you'll know you know how, how it's relevant. But a while ago, I um, uh, Rebecca, my oldest daughter, she said to me, "Daddy, have we got a family tree? I really want to know. You know, I want to have a look at the family tree." So I thought, "Well, no, I don't have a family tree," and and it. it it kind of shocked me how little I knew about my family, in fact. Mm. Um, so I went on to one of these websites. Um, I can't remember which one it was. Ancestry.com or something, something like that, I think it was. And um, you can do it for free. Have you, I mean, have you ever done anything like that? Have you, have you used one of those things? No. Um, the only reason I haven't is because uh, just a bit. With those types of um, businesses or those types of mm. sites, I was a bit skeptical about how accurate they are and yeah. how um, how you could actually prove whether they were right or wrong. I mean, I have, I have no idea, you know. Good points. Yeah, really good point there. But go on, that's, that's only the reason why I haven't done something. No, well, I never did because, you know, they're, they're, you always see them advertised on TV and stuff. Not that I watch a massive amount of TV, I must admit. But um, you see them advertised there. Maybe that's where Rebecca came across the idea. I don't know. But nevertheless, I thought, okay, well, I'll try it because, you know, I, I want to please her. She's my daughter. And I thought, yeah, she probably does have a right to know a little bit more about her family tree. So I went on to this thing, Ancestry.com, whatever it was. And essentially, it says, put in, you know, the people who you know about and put in as much information as you can. Mm. Um, so place of birth, um, date of birth, if you know it, their relationship to who, whoever. So you start with yourself, and I start with myself, and then I put my daughters in there, put my wife, then I put my parents and my uncles and aunts, and so on and so forth. Um, and, then, and then you kind of get a bit lost, because you know, how much do you really know about even your grandparents? You know, most of their information is gone. But luckily, my great-grandfather, Ben Travers, was, a, was very famous in his time, and so there was an awful lot of stuff written about him. And interestingly, he also wrote a couple of autobiographies, one of which he wrote when he was 94 years old, believe it or not. Um, and so there's a huge amount of information in those. And I, 
and I and I was able to. He's got also got a Wikipedia page. Um, if you, you're interested, you can have a look. Um, ben Travers, um, and so I was able to get quite a bit of information from both the Wikipedia on its own, and also um, because, well, I happened to have a copy of his autobiography, so I had a look through, and so I could get his mother, and I knew that his mother died of cancer. Um, sorry, his wife rather died of cancer. That's my grandma's, my great grandma. Um, very young, and I know that affected her deeply. Um, but there was a lot of information about it from a sort of contemporary point of view, rather than just from a hand-me-down point of view from my grandma. Mm. Um, so I got to see it from his point of view, his perspective. But it also told me about his parents, and his parents were very wealthy, and he had a business that he was supposed to go into and take over, and he didn't like it, and so on and so forth. Hence, he became a playwright. So this was kind of fascinating to me. But then I went back further because um, on the woman he married was from a very wealthy family. And a couple of generations back in that family um, was a guy who was very, very um, uh, famous in his time, I suppose, in certain, in certain channels. Certainly, there's a lot about written about him. And he was a, um, he was Lord somebody, or other, I forget his name, which kind of emphasizes my point. Uh, who he was um, anyway he was the governor of lots of different countries um, he was the governor or it wasn't called the governor but he he effectively ran Sri Lanka uh, in the time of the British Empire um, it was called Ceylon back then um, he also ran Guyana in South America Trinidad and Tobago he was the governor of these places he was the governor of British Honduras which is one day Belize he was the, the governor of the British Virgin Islands it sounds uh, like you've got a, a much more interesting family tree than most people do, do. <laughs> I absolutely doubt that. I doubt it massively. Yeah. yeah, I do. And I'll tell you why. And it comes back again, if you bear with me, to the exponential function. Right? But, but, the, but the fact of the matter is that there was an awful lot of stuff written about him. And because he came from a wealthy, powerful family, um, about them. And so I was amazed that within about a couple of hours of work, or maybe two or three hours of work, I had got back 10 generations um, in that particular branch, one branch of the family tree, 10 generations from my daughter through to a guy called um, Mr. Skinner, off the top of my head, I forget his first name, who was born in, of all places, Boston, Massachusetts. Mm. Now, I had no idea that if we go back 10 generations in my life, I am, I've always been half English, quarter Welsh, and quarter Irish, because my, one of my grandfathers was Welsh, my, one of my grandmothers was Irish, and therefore, you know, that's it. And that's as far back as we go. They're always Welsh, obviously, down that line, forever and ever, amen. And always Irish down the other line. And of course, on my side, uh, being, you know, half English, I guess they, that side of the family has always been English, but of course, it's not true. And I was staggered to discover that if we go back 10 generations, one of the branches of my family, the man who ultimately, we're, we're only talking about mothers and fathers, by the way, he is a direct ancestor. I'm a, I'm a direct descendant of him. I'm not uncles and aunts, just mothers and fathers. Although, you know, the family tree includes all the uncles and aunts as well. But he actually goes back to 1750, which is over 250 years ago. And he lived and he was born in Boston in the USA. Um, and then he married a woman who was born um, on a little island in the Caribbean that I'd never even heard of. And for the next four or five generations, that line of the family all lived on this little island in the Caribbean, which I, I had never, I didn't even know where it was. I had, to, I had to get out Google Earth and have a look and find it because it's a tiny little island. It's only a few miles long by a couple of miles wide. Um, and I can't even remember the name of it right now. I'd have to look it up. It's one that you've definitely never heard of. And so I was astonished to discover, you know, just how much information and knowledge had been lost. And, and then I thought about it. And I thought, well, I've only been able to go back 10 generations in one branch of the family tree. But what about all the others? And so I did a little bit of maths. And I was staggered to discover the exponential function was in place. And because if we just go back to mothers and fathers, mm. each and every single one of us 
even you, Tom, has got a mother and a father, right? And your mother <laughs> and a father had a mother and a father, and they each had a mother and a father, and so on and so forth. And so if you go backwards in time, right, we are seeing the exponential function in action because each generation roughly on average, I'd say, looking at my family tree, it's about 25 years on average per, per generation. So each generation that you go back, you've got twice as many mothers and fathers. And I'm not talking about uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters, you know, nephews and nieces and all that kind of stuff. I'm simply talking about mothers and fathers. And we have a direct line. And if we go back uh, and we double it, so you've got, I've got two, I've got one mother and one father, two grandmothers, two grandfathers, four great grandmothers, four great grandfathers. I'd already lost all of that information. I only knew about one side of the family. So I can't go back very far at all in many areas of the family tree. And yes, what you do, coming back to your point about how do they do it and how do you check it, they, they suggest things for you. So they suggest marriage certificates and death certificates um, for each person based on if these things are available, they're somehow in a database. So um, if, you, if you have a look and say, well, somebody or other Skinner back in Boston in, in you know, 17, he was born in Boston in 1750, and it, it says, we found someone, someone Skinner who was born in Boston 1750, and the more accurate you know the birth date, the more, the more accurate they're able to hone in on it. Sometimes they'll suggest lots of documents, and if you want to look at the documents, you need to pay them. Mm. So that's how they... That's how they get you either to subscribe and then you can review the documents and then you can build out your family tree. But what fascinated me was two things. Not only one, that all of this information, this comes back to something you told me the other day, is lost. I had no idea that for in one particular branch of my family, that for generation after generation after generation, they lived on a tiny little island in the Caribbean. Um, and I just had no idea about that. And the, the second thing about it was that um, it's the exponential function in action. And this really blew my mind because every single one of us has, um, there's us and then there's, um, there's, there's two parents, mother and a father, and then two grandparents and then each of those, sorry, four grandparents, each of them has two mother, has a mother and a father, okay? And then if you go back, one, two, three, four, five, I'm just getting my kicker out, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, so I've gone back 10 generations, and this really blew, me, blew my mind. In that 10 generations, I was able to track down one man, Mr. Skinner, and his wife. Okay, so that's a man and wife, that's two people. But in that generation, 10 generations back, for you and me and for every single person who's ever lived and ever will live, we each have 512 mothers and fathers who we are directly uh, descended from. Mm. I see what you um, mean. The further you go back, the number multiplies. That's your family multiplies multiplying. By yeah, by two, each and every generation. So if we go back 25 years from there, this approximately takes us back 250 years. So as we know, with the exponential function, we've got 512 mothers and fathers, not including brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, or anything like that, just mothers and fathers. But if we go back another 25 years, um, we times that number by two. And we have got, if I was able to do so, times two, uh, 1,024 mothers and fathers, plus, of course, uh, all the other mothers and fathers that lived since them. So we basically double that, uh, plus one for, for, for each and every one of us, okay? So we have, we're now directly related, just through mother and father alone, to, um, well, 1,024 people, 11 generations back, um, plus the 1,023 other people, I believe, um, from all the other generations that followed them. And that's just down 
each individual mother father tree um mm. so if we go back 12 generations it's 2048 and the long and short of it is the further back you go the the huger the number becomes mm. so 13 14 i'm just doing it now okay and i've messed it up there but by 14 generations we were directly related to over i think it was approximately eight and a half thousand eight thousand four hundred odd you'll have to do the maths yourself mothers and fathers but then we go back one more generation another 25 years and it's uh you know nearly nine thousand and and the staggering thing for me was that and i haven't got the maths in front of me but when i looked at it it is if we go back about 750 years more or less we're going about what are we going back to we're going back to i think 30 generations roughly um, 750 years, and if you think of history, what was going on 750 years ago, um, well, 500 years ago, more or less, was when Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas. Um, but if you go back 750 years, it was the Middle Ages, um, it was late Middle Ages even. Um, and, you know, we can go back much further. But if we go back to about roughly 750 years, each and every single one of us on the planet today is directly related through only mothers and fathers to more people in that one generation than exist today in the entire world. So we're each related to more than seven and a half billion mothers and fathers alone, not including all the uncles and aunts, brothers and sisters, and so on and so forth. And this, this absolutely just blew my mind. I don't know what you think about it. Maybe, you know, you've thought about this when you were about 12 and you got used to the idea. But for me, <laughs> somehow, it was the first time I was ever thinking about it. And it all came from doing this family tree. Then no, I, I, I wasn't thinking about there. those types of things when I was 12. I know that for sure. Well, I was no, really just... probably playing on my Super Nintendo or something. <laughs> and rightly so. Why not? When you can. <laughs> yeah. But the thing, the, thing, the thing that blew my mind is that um, if we go back 750 years, we're related to more people than have ever lived. Not only in that one generation, but then we've, we've almost doubled that figure to get between, between that generation, 30 generations ago, and, and where we are now. So the, the, the sheer number of people, the volume of people is simply impossible. And not just slightly impossible, but massively impossible. And that's just mothers and fathers. And... And, and this is just going back at roughly 30 generations, which is more or less 750 years. If we go back to the time when Jesus was born, then, you know, imagine that multiplying every 25 years by two. I mean, the figures are, well, just beyond comprehension. I think I worked it out and it came out with one of these mathematical numbers on my calculator, which says something to the power of 27. Um, which which it was basically all the numbers, uh, 13 digits um, times the power of 37 or 27 or something. It was just an astronomically large number, which I, I couldn't even begin to, 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 to put into words. Uh -huh. And that was how many people we are directly related to simply through mother and, mother and father um, link at the time of Jesus. I mean, I don't want to go back any further, but I mean, the pyramids were built 5,000 years ago, um, and, and something that always, I always found quite interesting, slightly going off topic, is, um, is uh, the most famous Egyptian of them all, um, with the pretty little nose in all the Asterix books, uh, you know, um, uh, <laughs> total memory blank there, what's her name? The, uh, oh. It begins with T. No, you're thinking of Tutankhamun, the eleven-year-old boy. I, I remember seeing that in a in a Mr. Peabody uh, Sherman and Mr. Peabody, which is a, a great movie for kids. A bit of a plug, but um, no, it's uh, Cleopatra. That's it. Okay. So Cleopatra was born. We always think of her as being from ancient uh, ancient Egypt, but she was born closer to the time of the mobile phone uh, than she was to the time when the, the the pyramids were built. So the pyramids were already ancient and thousands of years old when Cleopatra was, was living in, in, in Egypt. And that kind of blows my mind. But 
but nothing to the comparison that we're all obviously directly related to Cleopatra and every single other person on the planet. Um, but also because of the sheer numbers involved, which are you know mathematically impossible, it's simply it's just not possible that there were that many people. Um, it it made me think that there's one of two things going on. Either we're all incredibly inbred, all of us. It's a wonder <laughs> we don't have five chins and sixteen arms each. But we, we're all incredibly inbred because we must be. We we must be seeing all these billions and billions, trillions of people must be the same people repeating again and again and again. They must be, right? Otherwise, it's impossible. And so that's one option. And the other one is the impossible option. In other words, that none of these people really existed and that it's all a simulation. Because mathematically it cannot be, and therefore, if it cannot be, it isn't. And so we don't actually live in the real world. We're living on a computer simulation. And these people, the history didn't really happen. <laughs> I, don't, I think you're speechless. I think I'm going to go with Occam's razor on that one, dude. <laughs> Just the uh, well, the most most likely outcome is the one which uh, which is uh, which you you lead with. So um, yeah, I don't I don't think we're living in a simulation. I, mean, well, I know that uh, from a philosophical discussion mm. point of view, I think it's interesting. Um, but yeah, I think most most probable. Is that that's that's not the case? Well, I agree with you, and I I want to agree with you, but um, you know, it 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 does beg a belief the sheer number of people, and we're only going back to the time of Jesus, and uh, it's a allegedly impossible number. <laughs> well, yeah, allegedly, but it's it's an, it's a massively impossible number. We go back seven hundred and fifty years, and we're already basically directly related by mother and father alone. That link. Um, to more, well, probably more than double the number of people who've ever lived. And that's each and every single one of us. Not just me and not you. I mean, it's everybody. All the people who might listen to this are also related to absolutely everybody um, within way, probably way less than 750 years. Probably, you know, 300 years. So if I was able to go back in one branch of my uh, family tree, 10 generations, um, and I was able to track down two of the 502 people um, at that, who were in that generation, who were born at that time and, um, and were directly my mothers and fathers, or rather my grand great-great-grandmothers and great-great-grandfathers, or whatever they call when they go back that far. Mm. I mean, what about all the other people? And Super how many of those people are the same as yours? You know? So you think we're true. all we're all related to each other in some minor, minor way? No, I think we're all related to each other in some major way. <laughs> we're we're all. I mean, this is just mothers and fathers, not uncles and aunts. So, you know, if we go back, oh, there's me. Oh, sorry, that was me walking around, and I unplugged the uh, the speaker. Um, as I, I want to do. Sounds like yeah, you got it's... attacked by a cat in a cave for a very small <laughs> amount of time. Yeah, well, that's also a possibility in this, in, this, um, <laughs> in this weird world that we live in, you know, who knows? I think it was a door handle that hooked on as I strolled past holding my computer. Uh, everyone's done that. Except yeah. you did very well not to swear, I thought. <laughs> well, I'm, perhaps you didn't hear me because I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's because the microphone wasn't next to you that I didn't. It hear. wasn't. Yeah, there's no expletives. But um, no, I mean, the, my my point is a very serious one though. That we there is a huge, huge amount of knowledge that is missing, and that there's absolutely no doubt about it. It's one hundred percent guaranteed. The exponential function, um, what um, in another in another way, is, is essentially compound interest. Um, is what Albert Einstein said was the eighth wonder of the world. And he was absolutely spot on because this exponential function is 100% right and it is 100% a wonder of the world. How is it possible? And, and it, it, it's not just possible, it's absolutely 100% certain that we are all related to this number of people because every single um, generation has a mother and a father. 
and every single generation's mother and a father has a mother and a father um, and so we are literally definitely directly through mothers and fathers links alone related to absolutely every single person who's ever lived and some and it's the and some that i find interesting is so we're either massively massively um you know uh, interrelated and uh, you know there's there's a lot of you know these people are all the same people or um or we are living in a simulation i mean it is one or the other and the simulation i've got to admit sounds massively far-fetched and implausible so we're all inbred <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> the conclusion i get from it <laughs> we are literally all inbred um so this is the kind of way my mind works and um you know just from from a simple question from my daughter about can i have a look at a family tree you know most people would just maybe put together a bit of a family tree but to me i got completely and utterly swooped down on by this concept and uh, and it just blew my mind and i and it was a, a while ago now and i just sat down there with a big piece of paper and i i I did all the generations, I plotted them all out, and then I multiplied each one by two. I, I just, I couldn't believe the sheer number of people that were directly related to each of us. Mm. Um, and just how quickly we get to that point as well. It's, um, it just blew my mind. So yeah, we are all each other's brothers and sisters, or at least we're all definitely cousins, that's for sure. Um, so it's nice to, nice to know finally that we're related, Tom. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting um, one to start with. Anyway, um, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, mine's uh, more of a, um, you know, someone else's information than it is uh, an observation that you come up on on your own, um, and more. Well, of... Sorry, I like other people's information. Yeah, that's that. That's good. That's a good thing. So yeah, so the it was the um, it's referred to as the compound effect by uh, Darren Hardy. He's got a, a book called The Compound Effect, and initially um, the claim is that the exponential um, uh, growth happens exponential with um, with our behave our choices in life and um, our behaviours, and um, it compounds over time. And it affects where we end up, essentially. Mm. And I was, I was a little bit, um, like I had an initial reaction, like how, how's that even going to work? You know, um, as opposed to like the, the um, example you gave about money. Um, you know, it's very clear to see how that would work because it's math. Yeah. But like an, a, a short example of how it might lead to. A really good outcome versus a very bad one is like if you if you have a choice an initial choice of I don't know say whether you do exercise or not of a day mm. um, if you choose to do exercise it might make you feel better and therefore you might decide to I don't know eat better or you might decide to do a little bit of extra work or something along those lines uh, and if yeah. you decided not to if you decided to I don't know stay at home um, that might impact your next decision which in turn impacts your decision after that and these basically how these small little choices in your life hmm. um, they have a compound effect exactly so if you if you start by making good choices on a hmm. regular basis it will it will impact your life in in massive ways essentially um, and that was i don't know it was quite a big big deal to me because um it makes total sense to me, actually, I must say. Yeah. I know that um, it, it would have to be that choice over and over again. So in the, in the exponential issue, like, or not issue, but the, it's like 1% and then 1% again and then 1% again creates this exponential growth. Mm -hmm. It would have to kind of be steady choices rather than, um, you know, I make a good decision here or a bad decision there, which is what, a lot of people tend to do rather than making constant bad decisions but um yeah. well, you see how it might take you down a complete completely do. different route yeah totally uh, in a way if it was just one decision it would it would be a little bit there goes that door handle again <laughs> it would be a little bit like the butterfly effect you know where a butterfly 
flaps its wings in wherever it is, the USA, a knock-on effect, which, uh, which causes um, a typhoon and a, and a tsunami in Japan. Um, so it is a bit like that in that each, each action that we take has a consequence which takes us the world or you know in a different way very very slightly and most of these consequences are very very slight and aren't probably going to go very far maybe like a, a a small pebble rippling in a pond and eventually the uh you know the, the waves just die off and that's the end of that but um but if you do a regular thing um so if you make a decision to i don't know to get up and do a bit of exercise as you said uh every morning then you know this is this is yeah i can see how that's going to make you a little bit happier and it's going to give you get you up in the morning and you're going to create a new habit and that habit will then lead on to other habits and and i totally get that um and each habit um is compounded on the on the previous one so each improvement or it could go the other way i suppose if you if you make bad choices um can can grow over time and 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 lead to to a massively different outcome in your life um yeah i, I what's it called again this this uh, is it a, a book you read uh yeah it's called the compound effect so which sounds tremendously um, familiar but uh I, I don't think i've read it but um yeah exponential but, growth but um applied to behavior rather than um hmm. you know but, it is everywhere like actual numbers growth. I mean, we tried um we, we you know both of us we at some point in our lives tried uh, the roulette table as we discussed before you know and that's essentially the uh, exponential effect as well if you like compound interest the the technique that we were using which um i cannot for life of me remember what it's called uh, but it does have a specific name uh, and you know so you make a one pound bet on red on for example um, and if you win the red, you double your money, you get two pounds. But if, but if the, uh, the ball lands on black, then you, uh, you lose your one pound. And so the next time you put the two pounds on, uh, and this time you, ch you change to black because obviously black was the one it was going to land on. And then it lands on red and then you lose two pounds, but never fear you put four pounds on and you're going to stick with black this time. So you put four pounds on black again and so on and so forth until such time as you as it wins, um, because of the uh, the doubling effect, because of the um, uh, the exponential function, you you always end up one pound better off at the end of it than you were at the beginning. Um, and I know that we both tried that, and that's an, that's another way that it works. And and you can't argue with the maths, really. Um, I mean, what's the chances? And somebody will tell you what the chances are. But you think what what's the what's the odds that I'll get like ten um reds in a row when i'm when i'm put on my my stake on black i mean it's just not going to happen but each and every time is unique and has a 50 50 chance or slightly less than 50 50 chance which is why the house always wins mm. and um and over time you end up uh, i don't know how far you went with it tom um i saw it um 13 times in a row once so um incredible. yeah i think it was 13 reds in a row which was pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, um, it, it's just, I mean, it does happen, doesn't it? And when it does, you, and if you were, if you had your money on the black, then you'd have doubled one pound to the next, to the next, to the next. And by the time you got to 13 pound, uh, 13, um, you have got uh, a lot of money staked. Um, well, as we know, there were 500 and, what was it? Did I say 552? Um, with, with a double effect with my with my relative and your relative and everybody else's relatives, when you go back ten generations, it's five hundred and fifty-two. So if you were doubling on the roulette table, you'd have now had to stake on the tenth time five hundred and fifty-two pounds to get one pound back if if it lands on the on the black. Um, and if it doesn't, then you have to stake double the amount again so it, it adds up very very quickly and um yeah if you've seen it 13 times that's kind of scary <laughs> you know you you just the sheer amount of money you're having to gamble just to win one pound back you're and going into conspiracy theories at that point aren't you 
oh, you're oh, thinking yeah. about magnets and yeah you're right you think it's impossible it's impossible but it is just slightly less than 50 50 chance because you've got the green as well on the table so you know the every now and again you're, it's going to land on the green so you've got less than 50 50 chance of being right and over time that less than 50 50 chance will is always going to put you out of money but yeah but the other thing is that you know the casino is is doing really well because each time you lose you have to double your money but each time um you know and they take all those winnings and and you know, there comes a time when you run out of money or there's a limit on the table as to how much you can put in there and then you've lost a lot. And, um, you know, each time you put that stake on there, if it's the other number, if it's the other color that comes up, you lose your entire stake. But the casino is only basically going to give you one pound back, you know, because you've staked all that money and then, way well, you won. So they, you've won one pound. So it's massively in favor of the casino just from that perspective. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's the exponential function again. And, and it's just everywhere we look. And, you know, there are, I, I haven't even thought about all the other places that the exponential function is in, is in place. I know that you can use it to make a lot of money. Um, you know, you and I, we both read The Richest Man in Babylon. And in The Richest Man in Babylon, they say, put 10% of your income aside uh, and, you know, and then invest that once you have enough money and invest wisely and speak to people who know what they're talking about, so on and so forth. Um, but if you were to, to put aside an amount of money uh, from your income um, every, and I think you've done this as well, haven't you, Tom? Um, you know, every month, for example, over, over the course of your life, if you're able to get uh, positive interest on it, which isn't always that easy these days, especially uh, with very low interest rates mm. um, and uh, and inflation running slightly higher than perhaps they tell us. Um, well, then, if you if you can get a bit of interest on it, then that interest compounds over time, and you get interest on your interest, and and it's very slow at first. But towards the end of your life, if you consistently did it, um, it would then eventually be worth a huge amount of money and give you a really good retirement. Um, so it works there as well. But, um, but I, I was just blown away by the, the obviousness of the, of the family tree thing. That's what really struck me because I, I didn't expect to see it there and yet it's so obviously there. Yeah, that's so, pretty cool. Yeah, but anyway, um, yeah, the exponential function. Uh, all I can say, yeah, basically coming back to, um, coming back to, uh, Albert Einstein, he also um, tested out the roulette table and came to the conclusion that the only way uh, to beat the roulette table is, or the only way to win at roulette is to own the table. And um, so the guy who's, uh, you know, he's, he's a genius. He's Albert Einstein. So exponential function, I just, I love it. And I'm desperately trying to figure out other ways in which it impacts us just few, purely just from, from an interest <laughs> point of view. No pun intended. Um, I just, you know, if, if anyone knows of other ways that exponential function impacts our life, then I, I'd love to, love to find out about it. I'd love to know about it. One for the comments, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there you go. I'm all talked out, I think, on the exponential function. Um, but I, I would, I, you know, the, ne the next time I will, I, I discuss it, I'll definitely get the maths to hand so I can read off the actual figures rather than just sort of... Uh, well, what I was going to say actually is um, normally um, uh, you're not the... F well, it tends to be that someone else has also had this thought mm. and uh, yeah. someone else has decided to go and figure out these numbers as well. So it might be the case that a bit of Googling might give you, might give you some actual numbers and um, maybe some conclusions about whether we are all inbred. Oh, no, we're, we're definitely all inbred. That's, that's a given. We must be. I mean, bearing in mind that um, as, as far as we understand history at this moment, um, the Americas, North and South America, were isolated uh, human populations for thousands of years um, from the rest of the world. So 
um, this gene pool of people um, who are direct mothers and fathers was for a very, very long time, purely Africa, Asia, and Europe, and possibly um, at some point, uh, well, at some point, Australia, uh, the Aborigines became isolated as well. And then you got the South Sea Islanders who actually were isolated for a lot less time. So they definitely share our gene pool a bit more. Um, but we are, you know, we were all isolated. All of the rest of the world was isolated from North and South America. So um, we've got these two uh, pools of people that for a very, very long time within this exponential you know, doubling of mothers and fathers down the generations, um, looking, looking back at ancestors. They were isolated um, for the, over the last 500 years. So, you know, approximately, uh, I don't know, 20 generations. Um, we've, we've all been together. But prior to that, prior to these 20, last 20 generations, um, they were completely isolated from each other. And so, you know, these two numbers, I don't know, again, again, a little quick trip on Google will tell you how many people there were um, estimated to be living in the world at that time and how many of them were living in North and South America. Generations of people who were isolated for a very, very long time. So for an awful long time, they aren't even included on, you know, uh, on, on the family trees for the people who are in Europe and Africa. I mean, it must have been originally, especially if we understand that everyone came from Africa at one point. Uh, millions of years ago but um but yeah we're, we're you know they're, they're all interbred with each other and you know that uh we've got you know more people as directly as mothers and fathers in the gene pool than exist in there and we were all uh, inbred maybe the africans the europeans and the asians again for countless generations um mixing and matching and we must share all the same mothers and fathers i know we all look vastly different from each other but you know i think these differences are actually fairly superficial um and and possibly as a direct result of inbreeding because you know if you if you have a family trait where you've got big bushy eyebrows for example um you know and you you, you marry your cousins and they've got big bushy eyebrows then it stands a good chance that your children may have big bushy eyebrows so, you know, maybe that's why we superficially look so different. Um, and all the races, if, if we still call them that, are supposedly very different from each other. It's also very superficial because we're all definitely related to each other. Unless we, we do entertain the concept that we're living in a sort of matrix-like reality. So, I know I'm going on about it, but it's, it's just... It's just <laughs> I haven't got my head around it yet, so it's a, it's a mind blow. Right, it'd be, uh, be interesting to do some, um, some research on it, see what comes up. Well, you know, going back a bit more pop now, um, pop culture, um, Prince Harry and Meghan, was it Meghan Merkel? Myrtle, something? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I, I, I saw in the morning when I, when I get up, I, I, I never read newspapers. But I, I look at my, my phone and it has some news on there. And um, there's see what's trending. Stuff. Yeah, what's trending. So and they, one of them was about Meghan Merkel. Is it Merkel? I think so. Anyway, Meghan Merkel is something like uh, the 16th cousin from, from Prince Harry or something. And I don't know who worked that out. But, um, you know, Obviously, him being in the, the royal family, there's an amazing amount of, you know, writing and understanding about their, his particular family tree. But I just wonder how closely we're all related. Because 16th cousin sounds like, well, actually, she's related there. But 16 is quite a lot, you know. Mm. I, um... And I wonder, perhaps you and I are both related to either one of those people within 16 as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't know about that. Um, but I know that, or at least I've heard that the royals can be quite um, focused or prioritise their bloodline a little bit. That's so yeah, historically very, very true. They doesn't very... doesn't surprise me that they're um, they're not too far away in the bloodline. Well, Meghan Merkel apparently is. Uh... 
I mean, I I don't really know anything much about her, um, but I mean, that's what Google's for. But um, if you look on Wikipedia, but, which I'm going to do now because I've finally sat down, um, Megan Fox, Megan Markle. Maybe I'm getting it spelling it wrong, pronouncing it wrong. Megan Markle, right? Wikipedia, and I don't normally do this because I'm I have literally zero interest in famous people. Um, I, I, I don't know who, the, I mean, that's why I can't pronounce her name. I don't know anything about her at all. Oh, you see, um, I've watched Suits, so I, I've seen her character on Suits, and I, I love that program. Well, that's a really good tip. I think that might be the next one that I get to see now. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in um, sort of legal manoeuvring, hmm. um, in the sense that if you ever find yourself in a position where you have to, I don't know, go down a a legal route mm. um, a lot of it is sort of like playing poker you know lots of bluffs yeah. and um, suits is a great a great show to watch from that perspective oh we'll definitely give that a go then I know I know it must be it, it must be a good uh, good show because I've heard a lot of people talk about it but I've I just never have um, but um yeah so I, I knew literally nothing about her um, but uh, looking here, describing her ancestry, Markle said, my dad is Caucasian and my mum is African-American. I'm half black and half white. Uh, I've come to embrace this, uh, say who I am, to share where I'm from, to voice my pride in being a strong, confident, mixed-race woman. Um, and then it says her mother was descended from Africans enslaved in Georgia and her father from Dutch, English and Irish settlers. Um, and then it goes on to say, among her father's ancestors are Captain Christopher Hussey, Sir Philip Wentworth, and his wife, Mary Clifford, a descendant of King Edward III of England. So that's where the link is. Um, but it says Mary Clifford is a descendant of King Edward III of England. But the thing is, so are you, and so am I, <laughs> because the maths say we are. I mean, we, we probably aren't, but um, but we're pretty close to it. We are you telling me that I'm actually royalty then? Is that what you're saying? I've always known that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly feel but, an inflated sense of worth. Well, you shouldn't because royalty is <laughs> pretty damn common, <laughs> obviously. Um, but no, one, one thing is for sure is that in theory, she does not have, you know, on the surface, uh, she doesn't appear to have very much to do with the royal family, right? She's American, she's a uh, mixed race, um, and the white side of her family um, is Dutch, English, and Irish. So, I mean, there's a bit of a big gene pool there that she's drawing from. And yet, um, somebody somewhere has traced her back and found this link to the royal family. And I just wonder, um, it's a bit of a Kevin Bacon thing. I wonder how many people um it would take for us to link to the, to the royal family or to Meghan markle or to each other or to anybody mm. else yeah i see what you mean um and and using the exponential function um we're definitely linked at some point you know uh, we must be because of the sheer volume of people who we're directly directly um are descended from so yeah i mean i, I don't know i don't know how easy or difficult it would be to find that out um, with someone like Meghan Markle and the royal family pretty easy because there's a lot of people probably looking into that kind of thing but you know a lot of groundwork and probably um, sit down and seriously dedicate some time to looking at our who our ancestors are but you know 552 direct mothers and fathers in a line um, five, um, 10 generations back um, you know, what's the odds that uh, one of them or one of their, their cousins or whoever it may be um, is on your family tree somewhere or on somebody, anybody else's family tree? Yeah, I actually Another know one. someone who, um, who got a lord put on his uh, bank cards or on his, <laughs> on his like ID and that sort of thing. And um, the summary, essentially, that he said is, if you go back far enough, you can um, you can <laughs> find some sort yeah. of royalty where you can justify being called a lord. So, whenever any whenever he calls like a call center up or something like that, they call him lord. Fantastic! 
Yeah, see, this, this is, this is a, another use for the exponential function. Um, to be called Lord. <laughs> yeah, to be called Lord, and you know, we, we all can. I mean, I have uh, recently got, after many, many years of nagging, as you know, I've got a new puppy um, called Stella, and this little puppy is a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And I didn't really know very much about Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, uh, other than, well, that they were, they're good with children and they're not very big. Um, and they're, you know, they're good for, for young families. So I thought, great, that sounds like a dog for me. And um, we got a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And the other thing is that my grandmother had one called Chloe and she was bonkers and I loved her to bits. And um, she got run over by a Rolls Royce, which shows good taste for a, for a king um, to get run over by the king of cars. But uh, nevertheless, it was a pretty tragic end for her, but she was a wonderful little dog. And so I thought, okay, we'll get this Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. And since then, weirdly, um, you know, part of my job description, if you look on my CV, is as researcher. Um, but for some peculiar reason, when it came to the dogs, I was, I was a bit, pardon the pun, cavalier about it. And I didn't really do any research at all. I thought, yeah, cavalier, King Charles Spaniel, that'll do. I remember my, uh, my grandma's one, Chloe, she was great, I'll get one. But it turns out that there's quite a lot of inbreeding that's going on in particular races of, uh, not races, what are they called, breeds of dogs. And, um, uh, and, you know, there are certain health issues, which I wasn't aware of, and hopefully... Um, Stella won't have any of those, but there's a good possibility that she's inherited some of these things. And it's through inbreeding to make these different um, breeds of dogs. Um, and people have been, you know, it, it's kind of weird when you think about it, but people are saying, you know, I want a dog that's a little bit taller or has a bushier tail or, you know, whatever it is that you might want a dog to have. Um, and I think largely, not in, not in all cases, but in many cases, people have been thinking about what the dog aesthetically looks like or, you know, to serve a function. Or for example, you want a big aggressive dog, so you want a Rottweiler or a, mm. or a German Shepherd, you know, because you're a police dog, German Shepherd, makes sense. Um, uh, but a lot of the traits are also um, personality traits that come through. So we're looking at, you know, the, the, the particular dog that we've got is, is, is a cute little silly dog that just runs around and everyone loves and by goodness she's popular uh wherever we go everyone absolutely loves her which is exactly what you'd expect because she's very cute um but she's got character traits that run along with the uh for her breed and she's got very similar character to my grandmother's dog chloe uh and it's in because because of the way that the the, the breeding thing happens um and I've completely forgotten now why I mentioned that in the first place, but there was definitely a very pertinent point to it. Um, uh, they, oh, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I remember, I remember. It was, um, it was about the, the actual thing about the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, the name, where the dog's name comes from. Because I think it was King Charles I or King Charles II or possibly King Charles III, uh, one of my ancestors anyway and yours too, um, he, uh, he had one and loved them. And, um, he, if you look at the photo, not photos, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the portraits, uh, of him, he always had some of these little, uh, spaniels running around by his feet. And, um, and so they were named the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel because he absolutely loved them. Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff said about it. And if you Google it and look it up, um, you'll find that there's all sorts of rules and things that. These dogs are allowed in the Houses of Parliament. The only dog other than a blind dog that um, can walk into any pub in the United Kingdom and be served, or rather not be, not be barred, um, and are allowed into uh, Crown properties like courts and, um, and houses, of, houses of Lords, Houses of uh, Commons and other places of the like. Um, I don't think there's any truth in it. I think if I... If I took Stella to the House of Commons and demanded entrance, they'd say yeah, very clearly that I can go and shove it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, apparently, you know, people are coming up to me and telling me this. And, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm currently in Spain and my dog is in Spain and people are coming up to me. Uh, funny enough, most the, the King Charles Spaniel is not very well known in Spain. So most people don't know what kind of dog it is and ask me what kind of dog it is. But almost every foreigner that I meet automatically straight away says, oh, you've got a King Charles Spaniel. And, I, and then they say very often, 
are you gonna are you gonna take her to the House of Commons? Are you gonna take her to the uh, to Parliament? Are you gonna That's go? It's weird, isn't it? It's yeah. like one of those Absolutely. cultural things that we do. It's like an urban urban myth. I, I can't realistically believe. I mean, maybe there is a law. Maybe he did enact a law that said that that's possible, but I can't see anyone enforcing it. Do you know what I mean? So, but um, so so yeah, it's it's a weird thing, um, genealogy or whatever they call it. But um, I I just like to at this point hijack the conversation yet further and mention Chloe a little bit more because my grandpa uh, was a judge, and um, he did actually take. Chloe into court with him. Um, so now I'm wondering whether maybe there is a law and maybe he chose Chloe and he said, oh, I'm going to get a King Charles Spaniel so that I can take her into court with me. Um, or maybe. alternatively, possibly because he was the judge, nobody argued with him. But uh, either way, Chloe used to go to court regularly. I think um, if, it, if it had been like a sausage dog or something like that, I don't think you would have heard much objection. <laughs> no, if it's a massive, great big Rottweiler, or you know, yeah, I think or, I think you would have uh, got some some pushback on that one. But he he was funny. He he used to have a, mo a moped, and he would um, because every year we used to hire um, a canal boat, and we'd go on a holiday. The whole family. Um, my uncle had a canal boat, and so we'd hire another one. We'd have these two canal boats, and we'd go up the holiday. And we'd spend a week. We were usually somewhere around Oxford, and my grandpa had a. Um, had a friend who was a judge, and he, my grandpa was based in Cardiff um, and Swansea, and that's the, the courts that he had to go to, um, and or he was based in, and um, and his friend was in Oxford, and so they used to do a swap every summer, and um, a bit of, kind of like a house swap, I suppose, and um, or a job swap, and so every summer he would spend a week going to Oxford, and every every evening. We would um, we would spend the night in one of these canal boats, uh, and then he had his little moped which he'd put on the boat, and then the next uh, you know the, the next morning he would go off in his moped with the dog, um, and he'd drive to Oxford um, Crown Court, and he would park his moped in front of the court, and he the dog would hop off. Um, and he'd go into the little box and he'd put his helmet away and he'd put his wig on and his um and his robes and then he'd wander into the into the uh, the court um, and it was quite a spectacle apparently he got quite a lot of uh, comments as you can imagine yeah. and then in the evening he'd come back and um he would uh, uh, you know he'd, he'd he'd meet us he'd have arranged that we would go somewhere along the canal and then he'd uh, drive back down his moped and the dog and stuff, and and the whole thing would repeat every day for a week. And this is just something that I grew up with. So you know, maybe maybe there is. Um, I don't know why I ended up getting a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, but you know, there you go. So I've obviously got that in the family too. And being back on topic, I wonder how many other people have got fat Cavalier King Charles Spaniels in their family if they if they just knew. <laughs> I bet you have, Tom, somewhere. Uh, there's a golden retriever in my family, but other than that, I mean, I, I didn't, to be quite honest with you, I didn't know that there was a dog called a, um, what do you call it? <laughs> a king. A cavalier something. king, Charles Spaniel. Cavalier king, yeah, I didn't know that such a, a label existed. Well, it's not only that, but uh, there are different types of cavalier king, Charles Spaniel, it appears. And the, the type that we've got is a Blenheim, which means it's sort of a, sort of a, a gingery brown uh, and white color. There are other ones which have got um, three colors, black, brown, and white. Others that are just got brown and black and others that have got um, are just sort of the sort of ready brown color, each of which has its own name. And uh, I discovered all of this afterwards, even though I at one point on my CV um, was a researcher and didn't, did research for my living. Um, I didn't do any research before getting this dog at all. It was horrifically bad, and I shouldn't admit to that. But, um, but yeah, so I got a Blenheim one, um, and it turns out they're called Blenheim because they came from Blenheim Palace. After King Charles um, died, uh, one of Winston Churchill's ancestors, going back on the ancestor theme, um, was some massive aristocrat, 
and he lived at Blenheim Palace, which uh, incidentally is the world is the biggest palace in the United Kingdom, um, and bred the b- particular strain of Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, which was uh, just the two colours, the uh, the white and sort of reddy brown. And so there you go. Um, they come from the place where Winston Churchill was born. So there is kind of an illustrious past, really, in this dog that you until this morning never heard of. There you go. Um, so yeah, there you go. And all this comes from the exponential function <laughs> somehow. <laughs> well, you mentioned um, uh, somewhere along the way urban myths. Um, urban myths. I, yes. I, uh, I sort of. Um, I mean, it's a separate topic again, but um, mm. in the um, spirit of the calls, where you sort of discover you discover things and you share them. Um, mm. I thought it was, an, it was a good one to debunk as far as I, as far as I could tell is, it's a good one to debunk. Um, Ooh, and that, that is, um, when, uh, when Imogen's pregnant, um, mm. everyone said about, uh, playing classical music to the, the baby in the womb. Yeah. Cause it raises their, their IQ. That is, yeah. I heard that multiple times. Um, I have definitely heard that. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I did wonder at the time, you know, what's uh, I, that's that sounds unlikely, but um, you know, you sort of until you actually go and research these things, you know, I, I, you kind of get um, some perspective on it. But the what is based on originally is mm. a a study on teenagers, um, and that was you set them up with a task. Um, it's something to do with folding folding shapes or something like that fudging the words a little bit but it, some somewhere in that ballpark and it is if you um set a group up of teenagers up with you know folding these shapes mm. um if you do it just with with no um external influence at all and then you do it beforehand you play them classical music or during or something like that yeah. Um, there's an IQ bump of a few points when they're listening to classical music versus when they're just when they're not doing having any external influence. Um, and somehow, somewhere along the way, that had um, been sort of diluted, or um, you know, like Chinese whispers almost. Yeah. Um, to uh, to play classical music um, to to the baby in the womb, and it raises their IQ permanently. And it is a complete fiction <laughs> that is passed to, you know, sort of like, I don't know, some sort of advice yeah, to, to parents advice. that they should do. And it's just, it's just nonsense. It's just been based on something which is completely, almost completely unrelated. It, it, it's, um, so, yeah, what about other types of music, you know, and things like that? But um, I don't know. It's, it is weird how these things come out into the, into the sort of, I suppose uh, maybe it's a sort of popularism. It's a sort of popular belief structure that that sort of envelops the world. It sort of takes um, a life of its own, doesn't it? And yeah, it's like there's another one that I heard about, which was you know the you lose ten percent of your body heat, or no, you you lose ninety percent of your body heat through your head. Yeah, you know? I heard. I've seen that one in a film as well. Yeah, so you you lose ninety percent of your body heat through your head. Um, which of course is complete nonsense because um, you don't because your head is what maybe ten percent of your body weight um, and most of your your body loses loses heat and from if memory serves this came from another experiment where they had I think it was U.S. Marines or uh, some soldiers somewhere in the Arctic and they uh, and they basically kitted them all out with Arctic clothes and all the rest of it um but they didn't give them any hats <laughs> <laughs> so you can see where this is going now um so they lost all their body 90 percent of the body heat uh, through their heads because their heads were the least well protected from the cold so you know they were they were insulated by all these layers of clothing um on socks shoes trousers you know all these layers of of jumpers or whatever else they had and jackets and gloves and but they lost most of their um, 90% of their heat. Um, again, that sounds a bit, 90% sounds a bit sort of, uh, again, using the word cavalier. 
um, to just throw that number out there, 26 or is it 98? Or... Made up statistic. Yeah. yeah, made up statistics on the spot. But 90% sounds a bit too um, rounded. But, you know, there are statistics which are rounded and they always sound wrong. Um, so what you're saying is that if they had decided to only clothe people on the left side of their body, then... Yeah all of their heat would have been lost on the right side of their exactly. body. And therefore, you could claim that people lose 90% of their heat from the right side of their body. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, but there are other things which are interesting. Like um, here in Spain, people uh, talk about um, colds and, you know, a lot. And, you know, we know now that colds come from a virus and that you need to get the virus. And it's not necessarily to do with the temperature. Um, and yet there is a link because, um, as I understand it, and I'm no expert, so correct me if you're wrong, your wife is a, is a, is a doctor, so she, she will know more than I. But um, if you sneeze and you have the virus and it's hot, uh, a lot of the liquid um, that, you know, in the sneeze that contains the virus evaporates. And it evaporates much quickly, um, much more quickly um, because it's hot. Whereas when it's cold, uh, it doesn't. And it sort of floats around for ages before eventually settling onto the, onto the floor. Um, and so during the cold weather, all these people are walking around um, and they're breathing in the virus, which hasn't settled yet onto the floor. Um, this was mentioned, and I got this information um, offhand, as, as often information does come to you. And I got it when the, the Ebola virus outbreak in, in Africa, and they were saying, low and it's terrible and horrific but you know it's it's much better in africa than than in europe and in north america and i thought yeah that's fine for them to say i mean try saying that to someone who's living where the outbreak is occurring mm. um and then i but i listened more and they were saying that because of the cold temperature it would spread much more easily in in colder places um because you know a lot of the um the sneezing and so on and so forth now I don't know about Ebola. It may be that you can't get it from sneezing. Uh, I don't. I don't. I can't remember. Uh, my my brain filters out information that's not particularly useful to me at any given time, um, and so I, I don't know. But certainly with the the cold virus and the flu that I've recently suffered through, um, it, you know, it is a virus and it needs to be um, transported from one person to another, um, and it's certainly much easier to transport it when the weather is cold because it. It just the virus hangs around in in the atmosphere and on on hard surfaces and things for so much longer because it takes that much longer for it to evaporate have you heard um, of um, bill burr at all uh I, comedian I, bill burr i don't know bill bear sounds great <laughs> but <laughs> no, I don't. and he does a bit on um he says yeah i don't really know much about um ebola other than you have the extreme determination to go to the airport. He does a little bit on that. Yeah, well, I can um, believe that. But um, yeah, regarding the um, temperature thing mm. with uh, viruses, um, yeah. that, that should be a, a fairly easy one to prove based on um, colder countries versus hotter countries. Well, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. But, but I, still get, um, I still get told by my wife, who, who is Spanish, um, even though she knows this to be true, that it's a virus, she still, you know, through countless generations has been told um, to, you know, to make sure you wrap up warm when you go out so that you don't catch a cold. Um, well, wrapping up might stop you from getting a cold, possibly, because if you're, uh, you know, because maybe you're protected, you've got more surface protecting your skin and your body from potential contamination with the virus. But... Uh, but generally speaking, you, wrapping up warm might stop you from getting hypothermia and it might, you know, it, it might um, stop you from being so susceptible to the, the flu virus should you get it or the cold virus should you manage to pick it up. But, but the virus itself, it just spreads more easily in the cold. And it is interesting that people, um, you know, we, we've long known that and the word for a cold is cold in English. Um, and... Um, um, and you know, if you're if you've got a cold in Spanish, you're resfriado, which means you know you you've, you've got a you've got a cold. But frío is the word cold, so there's a link there as well. And it's so it's obviously, uh, you know, there there has been 
some observation for a very, very, very long time that people get colds in, in the winter more than they do in the summer, and mm. therefore it's the, the the obvious conclusion is that it's it's something to do with the cold. So, yeah, I I, I think you know these kind of urban myths are, are fascinating. I, I came across one the other day. You you know the Milgram experiment? I don't know. I think, um, well, this is the famous experiment where. Um, uh, Darren Brown has talked about it um, before, and it's where you get people who go in to do an experiment. Um, and it's been it's been done many, many times, but the original guy was the... was uh, it's the was white coat thing. The white coat thing, oh, yeah. Okay. The electric, the electric shock and zone electric. Right. So white coat. You, you as a stranger will give uh, another stranger an electric shock, um, or something like seven out of ten people would give them a, a lethal dose of electricity if they were told to by someone in a white coat. Mm. Now, apparently, I came across this the other day, that that's nonsense as well, because, in fact, the original experiment, they weren't wearing white coat. <laughs> 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 no, but apart from that, they were also specifically told at the beginning that the experiment could not harm, um, permanently harm these people, um, so you couldn't kill them. So the people knew that it was only a temporary thing um, and that the experiment was to serve a specific purpose, which was expl explained um, to, to the subjects. Obviously, they weren't explained, you know, they, didn't, they weren't told the correct reason, which was that they were being monitored. Mm -hmm. But um, they were told that it is to, to identify uh, something. And if you use wonderful Wikipedia, which never lies, you will discover that... Um, uh, what they were told as well, but but ultimately it was quite a controlled experiment, and um, and you know the, these the people who did take part in it, yes, they did uh, in theory give the uh, the victim a lethal dose of electricity, but they had been told previously that the victim wouldn't and couldn't be killed by it, uh, or in fact seriously harmed by it. So. Um, there's more to that experiment than than at first would appear. It seems to me. Well, I mean, the the way when it's um, sort of reenacted, or the the Darren Brown example is yeah. is exa exactly as um, as it's perceived to be. So yeah. um, you know, a, that's a, an example of where people have thought that that's the case, and then mm. it um, it turns out to act or. It, the conclusion is that exactly how they thought it would go. So, yeah, you know, that, and, it, and that it was the white coat, and I mean, I mean, it may it may have nothing to do with the white coat. In fact, it might just be the case that people, you know, like to be told what to do instead of thinking for themselves. I think a lot of people do, um, and also the other thing is that. Uh, you know, you've got your your school system where people are being, as children, they're being taught to to follow instructions and you know to uh and they're, they're being taught that you know or at least they were nowadays from from all the things you hear in the media um the, the, the classrooms are completely out of control but um nevertheless i mean you know certainly i was taught that the teacher was the authority in the classroom and um you know i i, I remember once and th this is Going, I guess going back to uh, the book that you mentioned earlier on, where um, I can't remember what, you, what what it was called now, so I've got a memory like a sieve. Um, talking about the compound again, effect. The compound effect, that's it. How can you not forget that? We're talking about it. But anyway, the compound effect, doing something every day. So I made a decision the other day based on what you said, which was that there are all these generations of people in our family and all that information lost. Um, because we don't know anything about their life story. We don't know what they did, what they thought, what they feared, if they got any fantastic gems of advice that they could tell us, which would make our life that much better. And it's all lost. And you said that you had thought that you don't want, you want that to end with you, and you don't want that, your life information, and your life story, and all this sort of stuff that you've spent your lifetime gathering, all this information and this knowledge, you don't want it to just be lost. So you want to write it down in a book and there it will be for your children and for their children and their descendants uh, should they wish to 
to take take you up on it. And of course, we know that people choose whether they're going to take information in or not. And you know, at different stages in your life, you, you may be ready or you may not be. Mm. But you want to capture that information and keep it there. And I thought well, the, the only that caveat the best idea. I would add to that is um, it's not for my sake uh, that I would do it. Yeah. It's because um, you know I don't want like my children to um, I don't know to 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 go through any um, I don't know difficulty in not knowing the type of type of information uh, that yeah. I, that they already in theory should have access to. So um, you know if you take the the example of exponential growth or um, you know mine uh, one of one of them is that um, you know we've we've done uh, a lot of information or education on um, persuasion and and marketing and that kind of thing exactly yeah. um, and you know the, the the very negative side of persuasion is like cult like um, behavior Indeed. so and cults follow a very uh, well, at least as far as I'm aware a very formulaic process in the sense that um, there, there's certain things that that need to be assumed or um, you know this this all, all the persuasion stuff yeah. um, is, is in cults and so if you know what someone's doing to you you're far less likely to be persuaded by so you'll know, recognize it people. you'll recognize it and and therefore be able to spot the trap if you like before it yeah and closes and can you can you imagine if you knew all, everything that you know someone was doing you could easily see what they're doing in terms of negative manipulation and your child or family member or whatever is being sort of hooked in by this person and mm. you know a lot of these cults that you hear about are extreme they're life destroying Oh, and all it would require, require, if I can get my words out, is just, you know, here's what I've learned. You don't necessarily have to take all of it in. This is just what I feel I've learned in my mm -hmm. life. And if it helps you, then, you know, that's great. But it's, it's such a simple thing to do. But it it's requires... Them, isn't it? Should they want Yeah, it? exactly. Um, it just requires a, a, a small amount of sacrifice to take time out of your normal life in order to get these ideas down one way or another, whether it be in and a podcast or in a book. So, well, this is the thing. So have you taken steps then to do it? Um, I've started uh, on some, I haven't got very far to be quite honest, but um, I have started a, I originally started it from the point of view of um, a, just like here are my thoughts. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought it might be better if I wrote about my experience because it would be that much quicker and clearer. So, and then write write about what uh, what that's taught me. So that's that's a really good idea. So are your experiences essentially anecdotes? So it's anecdotal evidence, and then this is what this I learned from this particular experience or how, how uh, well you you mentioned someone's memoirs so mm. you know this is my life this is what what has happened to me because again that's more information that has been lost i mean yeah. i don't know about you but i'd quite like to know what happened in my close relatives lives because well you know, actually even... the older you get on the the less of that the more of that information dies because you don't ask people and then they die and then you can't ask them and Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. But I absolutely, totally, and utterly agree with what you're saying, and I'm on the same page because I, I started writing my autobiography when my my first daughter was born shortly after. But I, I, I didn't have any time because I was working full time and I was doing my YouTube channel and I was, you know, I was just I was. It was always something that I wanted to do, but then I wanted to do so many other things. I was a little bit lost and trying to trying to trying to do it was a bit like juggling you know you're trying to juggle as many balls as you physically can and then some get lost or forgotten about or fall out mm. and this was one of them and i and i wrote a few chapters um about started with my earliest memories and so on and so forth and then i left it for years uh, i still got it on my computer and i left it for years until you mentioned this um and the and the actual fact is i'd really recently been thinking about it because of the exponential uh, function, because of the looking back at the family tree, because of the uh, 
you know, the fact that there's all this knowledge that's lost and all these people who have lost. And, and my wife's mother, my mother-in-law, always said that she wanted to write a memoir of when she was growing up because she uh, had a fantastically interesting life. In not, not in so much that it's interesting because she did all these things, but because of how much the world has changed for her in where she grew up. Because she grew up in the Costa del Sol in Ben Omadina, just outside the village. This is my wife's mother. There was no education. Uh, they had no electricity. They had no running water. They had to go every day as the girls were, were taught that they had to um, they had to go. They had animals living in the in the ground floor. It was like something out of the, the medieval time. And every day the girls had to go off uh, and they had to um, uh, take the buckets and they'd have to go and milk the cows and so on and so forth. And then after that, they'd have to go into the into the town where there was a natural stream. And all the women from the town met at the stream every day and they all talked and said, you know, talked probably about all the women who weren't there at that time, I would imagine. And, um, and anyway, they did their washing in the stream and they, that's also where they collected the water. And so my wife, Elvira, her, her mother, my mother-in-law, grew up in this, this medieval world that's so, so massively different to the world of Ben Almadena or Spain or, or anywhere really in, in Europe, certainly, today. And it's just, it's, it's like the jump between these two, it's like a parallel dimension almost, you know? And she yeah. wanted to write all about it and then she died. She got cancer and she passed away. And, it, and it, all of this information, I used to really enjoy sitting there talking with her. And of course there was the, you know, the language barriers. I was learning Spanish and I couldn't understand everything, but I, I, could, she, I could just sit there. You're not supposed to like your mother-in-law. I appreciate that. And I apologize to all these, uh, you know, these uh, traditionalists that like to stick to the, to the way things are supposed to be done. But I actually really enjoyed spending time with her because she had this wealth of fascinating information that just blew my mind. Yeah, I don't buy the whole, um, you know, not not liking your whole, not liking your in-laws stuff. No, I think it's, that's um, it's, that's another one of those things that, yeah. even if it was, um, you know, even if you did have a negative experience, you know, it's, it's down to you, down to you to make yeah. your your life. Um, well, you I don't know, know as good as it can be, I suppose. You know, if if you want to have a relationship with someone that's positive, then you need to be. I don't know. You need to be at least trying. What's the the phrase uh, in How to Win Friends and Influence People? Um, if you want uh, interesting, um, oh yeah. If you if you want to be interesting, you need to be interested. Something like that. Exactly. Well, she. I mean, I came from a totally different world from her. I mean, it was just one generation away, but it was an utterly different world and. And it just, it, it kind of makes me feel a little bit sad because now she's the grandmother of my children. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's not there to, to, to pass this information on this, you know, this fascinating otherworldly experience where, you know, just two generations before my, my child who sits there moaning about school and playing on her phone. Um, uh, you know, she's a wonderful little girl and, and, She's, I'm talking about Rebecca, but Lara's not far behind because she's, she's nearly 10 now. So she's, she's soon going to be running her mobile phone as well. They're both massively plugged into the modern world. Um, and they are, we are currently living in my, my in-law's house because, um, you, know, current, you know, it's a temporary thing, but we're living in their house. Or we're living there. But, uh, but yeah, they, they came from such a radically different world in such a short time. You know, imagine growing up without water, without electricity, you know, without having any education. Um, and and this, was, uh, this was in Europe and this was, you know, in the 19, well, in, in the Franco's time. So we're talking, she was born in 1945. So um, she grew up uh, just after the Second World War. Um, it just blows my mind. No electricity, no education, no nothing. Mm. Um, and yet she, she, she educated herself, you know, and she didn't have access to the internet or anything like that. And she still educated herself. She's a very well-read well woman. Um, 
and you know there's all this information that's just gone so i thought like you and you kind of reminded me of it when you, when we had that discussion the other day and i just thought i've got to do this too but i and i went back and i found my um, my my autobiography that i'd started all those years ago and then i thought you know but it's it's so difficult to to sit down and write a book especially when you've got all these other things going on but, but then it occurred to me that what if i just break it down into individual anecdotes um, and at first, that's what I'm going to do, because I just want to document my actual life. So I just think every day now, and I've done this since Monday, so I'm going back, today's Wednesday, so we're going back, you know, two whole days. I haven't done it yet today, but I will. Um, even if it takes five or ten minutes, just to write down a memory that I had of an individual occurrence that happened. And I've, I've set up the autobiography into sections based on time timeline essentially so i'm going to put them into um and i'm just whenever i'm whatever i think about every day i'm just going to add one little anecdote and i'm not going to try and analyze it or anything like that i'm simply going to put down what happened um and then if you think i if i can do that every day or even if i don't do it every single day but i just do it five days a week or something i'm still going to do 250 or 300 different anecdotes things that have happened in my life in and you know some of them will literally just take five minutes to do oh such and such happened and there you go and others will take you know a little bit longer it might take an hour or something mm. but um but i can do that i've got the time to do that and at the end of the the year or however long it takes i will have finally put down all of the things that happened to me and the thing about it is when you think about these things in retrospect um it does sort of make you think of certain things which you know well what, what did that really mean and how did that affect me and and then you can um and then i'm thinking well when i do that i'll just make a note of that and perhaps at the at the end or in some way during the process of writing i will i will capture that information and so maybe put, put my thoughts so that i'm not just putting in my experiences but also putting in you know certain things that I've learned along the way. Um, so, and that all came from you, Tom, and you know, you, you're a massive influence on me and you always have been um, in so many ways, but that, but it, it's, it's like that idea existed within me, but I perhaps I needed just the, the discussion with you, you know, this, we needed this touch point to just to whirl that idea around and swirl it around and then, and then both come to the same conclusion. But it blew my mind that we were both thinking along those lines. I can't um, remember exactly so where it came from, but um, there's a phrase uh, which says that people need to be reminded more than they need to be instructed. And that I, th Another pearl of wisdom. I think is in relation to sort of coaching, mentoring type stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's totally true in the sense that even you'd already made up your mind, but you were reminded about it and you thought, yeah, I really need to do that. But, you know, how many things do we need to do? And we know we need to do them. And then we just, you know, we, we put them to the side and we forget about them. No, oh, that's so, where the exponential or compound effect comes in. There you are, you see. So it's all, this is all one reasonably concise conversation, although it doesn't <laughs> feel like it. But, you know, the thing about exponential, um, uh, uh, it, it, well, the thing about the exponential function is that you can start off with an idea um, and it does kind of relate to, to every other idea in some way. Um, and so in, a, in effect, I guess this conversation is, is a good example of the exponential function in that way. And the other thing about the exponential function that occurred to me just while we were thinking about this um, and, and, and talking about the idea of putting in this information and information being lost um, is that you know, all of those people um, that are my direct ancestors, uh, I, I'm sure that they would like to give me a pearl of their, even if it was just one item of wisdom each, you know. So they can't because they're, they're gone. But, but if they could, you know, they, they would like to give me one piece of information each, I'm sure. And, um, and just imagine the wealth of that knowledge, you know. The, you know, if you if you could say, the, what's the most important, the single most important lesson that you've learned in your life, and you can just pass that on to someone? I mean, imagine just in ten generations, five hundred and fifty-two people just saying, you know, we 
we're directly related to you and each of these 552 pearls of wisdom is the is the is the, is the, the, the most important thing lessons that i have learned in my life imagine if you had access to that information just how potent and useful it would be to you it would be it would change your life wouldn't it really mm. but i guess well, that, in a way that reminds me of um what what i sent you recently and you can tell who i've been um who i've been listening to lately <laughs> and there's uh something like a 10 or 11 minute video on youtube uh, of darren hardy talking about um something like 100 years of wisdom in 11 or 10 or 11 minutes something yeah. like that yeah. and that uh comes back to the the point about of that piece of wisdom that he wanted to pass down this guy was that there is only a few things just a few things two or three things that matter to doing anything hmm. um i know we've discussed it yeah but if you take any i don't know any any sort of subject or topic or something and um boil it down to just the the main important things you know that's what you focus on in order to get the best outcome out of it that's that's, that's it. really 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 important and that kind of i think is yeah you shared that with me and i think that maybe that's maybe that's the the catalyst of, of all this the, this conversation that we're actually having right now and the exponential function uh, in, in actual fact um but but it, it also occurs to me that um you know in doing that we've we've thought about um all sorts of other things that have led us to this point where we're at now um and and it might not initially have seemed that we would get to where we are now or you know in the direction that we're going in uh, whatever direction that may be but um but it, you can kind of retrospectively look back and somehow there are certain points which where you get a bit of information and then it kind of forces you down to think of things in a different way um and this comes back down to uh, the compound effects that you mentioned before and the other the other thing that um, the compound effect is is the internet right i mean the internet itself is is the compound effect in action mm. because you know you have a little bit of information or you you have a thought or whatever and you put it out on the internet and then that mixes with somebody else that inspires somebody else or they disagree with it and that triggers a, a bit of a discussion somewhere on some chat or whatever it may be and that inspires somebody else or you know and, and it grows exponentially and uh, and now we're at the point where we have at our fingertips you know i just, just go on wikipedia or it could be anything or you can google it or you can do whatever you want and we have so much information at our fingertips and it's just absolutely extraordinary and it is the exponential function in action really it's the compound of all of the knowledge of all of the people who put information into the internet and it appears it occurs to me that almost we, we we're kind of we should be obligated to you know nobody should be obligated to do anything but it feels to me almost like an obligation that i have that i i must put my ideas and things out into the internet simply that you know that they're there and if if only one person amongst the seven billion people who currently exist sort of picks up on that idea and it affects them in a way and it makes them think about the world in a slightly different way i mean that's that's a that's a gold mine that's a gem that's something that's that you know that, that's out there and and might take the world in a completely different way and it's all the compound the compound um, function it's the compound interest it's the, the exponential function in action and i just i just i'm in love with the, the compound I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm just in love with the compound interest thing at the moment and the exponential function i just think it's um it's got it's got a huge amount of power in there um in so many different ways so yeah i, I don't know uh, the whole thing the whole that this whole topic this whole conversation is just tremendously interesting to me it may not be interesting to other people but there's going to be some someone out there that that you know of the myriad of sort of uh things that we've discussed it's it's, it's going to resonate with them in somehow and you know and even if it, even if someone just thinks yeah I, you know what i might write my autobiography and you know perhaps i can't do it all in one go you know where do you start writing a book it's not an easy thing to do and 
you know, as you know, Tom, I've, I've written a book and I've rewritten a book and I've rewritten a book and I've rewritten a book. You know, I've done five drafts and then I thought, you know, I'm going to let it rest for 10 years or 20 years or something. <laughs> so you can come back to it. Because <laughs> um, I've never been happy with it. But if you just approach your own life, we're just putting down, you know, whether it's uh, little anecdotes that have happened to you throughout your life or, or whether it's just thoughts and things at the time you have them. You know, just, uh, you know, this happened to me or I've, I've realized in my life that this, the exponential function is amazing and you should really investigate it and use it to your advantage um, or whatever it may be. You know, if, if somebody listens to what we're saying now and thinks, yeah, I'm going to do that, then that's another wodge of knowledge and that's, that, that's going to be spread down throughout the generations in their own family tree or at least mm. has the potential to be. And it's, that's just an amazing, amazing thing to think about, I think. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, right. Jackie boy. There you go. So <laughs> I think we've done the exponential uh, function uh, if in some serious detail. Um, and I, I like that it's completely been all over the place and no real structure to it. I, I really like that format. Um, or lack of format, as the case may be. But uh, yeah, I think uh, unless you've got any other things to say, I think I'm all I'm all just about um, exponentially functioned out. Well, um, I don't think my my bladder can go on anymore, so I think I'm good for <laughs> for this week. All right, okay then. So I guess we'll have to think of another topic to completely thrash and destroy um, next week. <laughs> Well, um, I'd kind of like to do, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be next week, but I'd kind of like to, to do some of those, um, cover some of the topics that we talked about in relation to lessons that you'd like to hand down. I think that they'd be, uh, they'd be a good place to start. Well, I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, okay. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's do that then. So, right, you go off and uh, empty your bladder and I will... Uh, plug my computer in so I think it's just about to run out of battery there's ab absolutely no chance of my staying tethered to the uh, um, to the power source there I, I had to literally unplug and wander off uh, but I am impressed I only hooked my um, headphones in twice as I walked past the door with the door handle guttering out but, so um, annoying catching your headphones in the door <laughs> wow well, you know you, you gotta learn from these things and um, perhaps I'm pretty slow to learn by them but never mind Anyway, yeah, really great chatting with you, Tom, as always. And I'm really looking forward to, yeah, some of the, I want to hear about one of these lessons you've learned. All right, mate, I'll have a think about it. And uh, maybe we can start off with the, uh, with next week, with whatever it is that I've pulled out of the air. Magic. All right, then. All right, mate. <laughs> All right, take care. Thanks for talking. Bye. Bye. No worries. Bye.